a Portland Community College Mathematics Telecourse. A course in arithmetic review produced at Portland Community College. When using numbers, decimals in particular, some are exact, like the price on a box of cereal, $3.57. That's exact, right to the veriest penny. But when you think about it, most numbers that you encounter are not exact. An example, if you're driving your car and you look at your speedometer and it looks like this, how fast are you driving? Now what's the best you can really say? It's probably a little bit less than 45 miles an hour. Closer maybe to 44. See, you're trying to approximate what it is exactly we don't know. With radar, perhaps we could find it. Not exactly, though. Even with radar, just with more accuracy than this speedometer. So see, the accuracy, we can read this speedometer or any physical instrument, including, say, this ruler, depends upon several factors. How well is your instrument calibrated? Some instruments are calibrated more than the others. Many have to be calibrated at regular intervals. How finely is the device marked? See, these are only marked to every five miles per hour, whereas this ruler is marked to the nearest sixteenth of an inch, and some rulers are marked to the nearest tenth of an inch. Some to the nearest thousandth. We call those micrometers. And lastly, how well can you read it? See here, it looks like we'd want to read it to the nearest 44 miles per hour. Someone else might want to say it's closer to 45. For a moment, think about the kinds of questions most frequently asked concerning number or amount. For instance, how many people live in your city? Now, if you were to ask me that, I would probably tell you about 400,000. Now, at the units, tens, and hundreds place, our city population is changing every single day. But rounded to the nearest hundred thousands has been this for a couple of decades now. So we give them an approximation. That's good enough for our intent. If someone were to ask, how much was your salary last year? You might reply simply about $21,000 or whatever it was, but you would not give it to the nearest penny, or chances are to the nearest hundred dollars, chances are you don't remember. But you do remember perhaps to the nearest thousands of dollars. So most numbers we use in our daily lives are in fact approximations. And in particular most decimal numbers are approximations. As an example, when you say a person's degree temperature is 101.3 degrees Fahrenheit, you're really telling me how well you can read the thermometer, which at best can be read to the nearest tenth of a degree. As a matter of fact, in engineering and statistics, proper round-off, that is approximations, is often as important as the arithmetic and math itself. You can change the character of a problem entirely just by rounding off differently from your inputted data. So for the sake of our exercise, we will tell you where we want it rounded, but in practice, the circumstances determine that. And the rules we will use are essentially the same as with whole numbers. You're going to mark the place at which the round off is desired. Look at only that digit to its immediate right. If it is five or more, round up. That is, add one to the spot at which you wish to round off. If it is four or less, round down. That is, leave it as it is. And then finally, drop all digits to the right of the round off place. Let's go back to our examples. Supposing we were asked to round to the nearest hundredth, 
Now, in this case, someone just told us to. Why, we don't know. That's to be deter determined by the application. The first thing we do is to mentally or on paper mark the place at which the round off is to be desired. Then look only at the digit next to it. In this case, there's only one to begin with. In this case, there is more than one, but look only at this one. We can't overemphasize that. If that digit is five or more, drop it and add one to the one at which we were to round off. And that would give me 3.58, adding that on. Again, mark the place at which the round off is to occur. Look at the digit just to its right. If it's five or more, drop everything and add one at that place. And we would now have, in this case, 10.09. Again, round up. If the next digit to its right is five or more and drop the following digits. Now let's look at a case where we will have to round down. Say in this one, we want to round to the nearest tenth. So you mark the place, either mentally or actually, that you wish to round off. Then look immediately to its right. If that's four or less, you round down. That is, you leave this alone. So it'll be eight, six, point three, and drop everything that follows. Okay, this is four or less, so you drop them, and that leaves you four point eight. Again, here's where you wish to round off. That's four or less, so you drop it which leaves you 100.0. Now the question is, do I need this zero? The answer is no, as far as its value is concerned. But if I dropped it in this case and you knew it was rounded off, you would think it was rounded to the nearest whole number, when in fact it was originally rounded to the nearest tenth. So when rounding off, we keep the rounded off digits. We do not keep the dropped digits with decimals. Recall with whole numbers we even kept these sometimes to preserve the magnitude. So again, keeping this does not change or add to its value, but keeping it does tell me that it's accurate all the way out to the tenth and not at the nearest whole number. So in rounding, at five or more we round it up. At four or less, as in these three cases, we dropped, which we call rounding down. Now this one asks that we round to the nearest whole number. Decimals are not whole numbers. The whole nearest whole number is the ones. So if I want to round to the nearest whole number, the nearest one, I look to the place to its immediate right, in this case a tenths position, that's four or less, so I drop and leave that exactly as it is. Okay, nearest whole number to its immediate right, that's five or more, so I add one here, which gives me 254. Here, I want to round to the nearest whole number, which happens to be zero, but that's no matter. The one to its nearest right is five or more, so I add one, so that gives me one. And of course, 78's 100 is closer to one than it is to zero. And 8.43 is closer to eight than it is the next one, nine. And 253.7 is closer to 254, see it's almost there, than it is to 253. So whenever you're rounding, remember you're always approximating that same number.
Now, as simple as this procedure is, there are several spots that, for some reason, seem to be stumbling blocks. So let's look at them carefully. Illustrate one of those pitfalls with this problem, where they ask us to round to the nearest hundredth. There's a tendency sometimes to confuse the hundredth with the word hundred. The TH tells me to get over to the decimal portion, not up here. So we want to round to the nearest hundredth, so there's tenth, hundredth. The digit to its immediate right is four or less, so I drop them and leave these. So my answer is 485, and this is a case where I will keep these zeros. Not to affect its value, because this has the same value but to tell somebody looking at this number that is not accurate to the nearest whole number. In fact, these zeros are accuracy zeros. It's accurate out that far. Beyond that, I don't know. I've dropped them. They're lost. So do not confuse the decimal notation with the whole number notation. And the TH is there for that purpose. Now, it looks like the same problem, doesn't it? But now they really do want us to round off to the nearest hundred. So here's the hundreds position. See, ones, tenths, hundred. See, three places over here to get to hundred, two places here to get to hundredth. Okay, I look at the digit just to its immediate right. That's five or more, so I add one to that. But if I quit there, are we really going to say that 5 is approximately 485 plus? Not at all. It's not even close. So in this case, we're forced to, even though we turn these to zeros in our rounding off, we must keep these zeros. Because it is correct to say that 500 is in fact approximately equal to 485 point so forth, so forth, so forth. So note the times we have to keep zeros. In this case, we must keep the zero to keep the magnitude in the proper range. In the last problem, we had to keep the zeros not to keep the magnitude, but to assure that somebody reading this would know where we rounded off. Now in this case, if you saw 500 and didn't know where it came from, you would not know whether it was rounded to the nearest 500, tens, or hundreds. We've lost that. We don't know that at all. But for sure, if I lost the two zeros, I've lost everything. Here's a situation which can cause confusion to the beginner. We are to round to the nearest thousandth. That's that spot. So we look at the digit just to its right, which is five or more. So we drop that, adding 1 at this spot. But if I add 1 to 9, I get 0, carry 1. Add 1 to 9, I get 0, carry 1. Then I get 9, 2, and 3. So sometimes, by because of 9s, by increasing it by 1 to round up, I start a chain reaction, and many students will ask, what happens if that occurs? And the response is, well, you let it occur. You have no choice about that. What happens to the numbers happens. But here is another case where we do indeed keep these two zeros to indicate to someone that we have rounded to the nearest thousandth. So in this case, we have two lessons. One, when you round and it starts to carry up, let it. And the other one is we must keep zeros in order to indicate to an observer who doesn't have this, just this, how accurate that answer really was. Find the position at which you're directed to round off. Look at the digit just to its right and only that. If it's five or more, you drop adding 1 to the digit before, which sometimes will turn it to a 0. 
which you're required to keep to communicate the degree of round off. Again, look to the place immediately to the right and only there. Some people will be careless and try to go all the way to the end and round up, round up, all the way up. But look only, repeat, only at that one digit to the immediate right. The rest have as absolutely nothing to do with it. If it's four or more, you round down, which means you leave it, the round off digit, exactly as it is. Simple, but can be tricky if you're not thinking. Let's be very, very clear that we understand this last step of our round off rules because it's not 100% true where we want to drop all the digits to the right of the round off place. In fact, it only applies to the decimal situation. So in this particular example, if I were asked to round to the nearest thousandth, I find that place specified, tenth, hundredth, thousandth. I look only at the digit to its immediate right. In this case, it's five or more, so I add one to the place I wish to keep. So four and one give me five, and leave everything to the front everything to the front, including the whole number, unchanged. And from that point on, I drop. So these digits here have been dropped. But note this only applies behind to the right of the decimal point. If, on the other hand, the same number were requested to be rounded in the whole numbers portion, in this case to the nearest thousand. So there's units, tens, hundreds, thousand. I still look to the immediate right. In this case, this is four or, or less, so I round down. So this stays two, this stays five, but now I am forced to include these three zeros, not because of the round off procedures, but in order to keep the magnitude proper. Now, are you comfortable with the word magnitude? That means place value. And this number, the 52, the two I'm keeping are in the thousands place. And if I were to throw these away, that is, drop them, I'm saying that, would be saying that 52 and 52,300 are about the same number. And just think about this. If these were both money, would you be satisfied with this instead of this? And the answer is certainly not but you would be reasonably satisfied with this. So with whole numbers, once we've rounded at a designated location, we usually must insert placeholder zeros in order to keep the overall size, the place value size, which scientists will call magnitude of the number, in the proper range, in this case, in the thousand range. So when we say drop all the zeros to the right or the digits to the right, we mean only with decimal numbers from the point that I wanted to round off on. If we round at that point, then the rest of these are dropped, but not with whole numbers. Do you see that clearly? That's easy, but it's a very subtle point and quite frequently misunderstood by a student who's listening or working too quickly. Also, be aware of when even decimal zeros must be kept in order to show just where the round off occurred. An example, here where we're requested again to round to the nearest thousandth, the decimal portion, there's tenth, hundredth, 
thousand. So we find the place we wish to round at, if you would. Look at the digit just to its right. That's four or less, so I will drop it. I won't insert zeros because I'm behind the decimal point. But now, in fact, I must keep these zeros in front of the round off location, not for the value of the number, because a lesson or two ago, we found that this number and this number indeed have the same value. But we must keep these zeros in order to tell somebody that this is accurate out to here. If I only had this, then somebody might think that I rounded at the nearest tenth, when in fact that's an accurate zero. That's an accurate zero. That's an accurate zero. From here on out, if I were to stick on zeros, they would not be accuracy zeros. They would be completely misleading. Do you see that? That's very, very subtle, but very important in science and technology. Because there, you're not just reporting the value of a number. Simultaneously, you're reporting the accuracy on the number. And that's very, very important in science, technology, and statistics. Let's, let's tie all of that together now. Here we have four different numbers, but we wish them all rounded to the hundredth, the decimal portion. So in every single case, we will go out to the nearest hundredth. Tenth, hundredth. In every single case, we'll look only at the digit before it. If it's five or more, we add one to the place at which I wish to round. Leave everything in front of that exactly the same, and throw these away because it's behind the decimal point. Now we simply apply that to every single number and be very, very careful that we don't change from that rule even if the results look strange. So going down to here, here's the nearest hundredth. The digit before it is four or less. And see, don't be tempted to round from the nine up to here to five and that up. You look only at the digit to its immediate right. If it's four or less, you drop it and leave everything in front exactly the same. Here again, you find the nearest hundredth. Look only at the digit before it. It's four or less, so you drop because it's behind the decimal point. And everything in front you keep, including these zeros. So that now we can report not only is our number 487, but it's accurate to the nearest hundredth, which this would not report. Down here, again, we find the nearest hundredth. Look only at the single digit to its right. In this case, it's five or more, so I'm going to add one to this spot while throwing this away. But adding one to that nine gives me a zero. Carrying one to that nine, which gives me another zero. Carrying that one to the next nine, which gives me yet another zero. And finally, only up in the tens place does my carrying quit. But here again, I must keep these two zeros to indicate the accuracy of my number. So the rule is quite simply, with decimal numbers, you look immediately to the right to where you want to round. If it's five or more, you add one to that, dropping all of these. And whatever you get, by adding one, you get. If the one immediately to the right is less four or less, you drop it, keeping everything in front, including zeros, if that's what you get. So the rule is very simple. 
The temptation sometimes is to not follow the rule because you get something that looks a little bit strange. But the rule is firm. It never varies. And, of course, always be sure that you note, am I in the decimal portion at the round off or am I in the whole number portion? In here, we wish to go to the nearest whole number portion, that is, to the left of the decimal point, whether in fact or implied. So here's tenth, units rather, tenth, hundredth. So there is where I wish to round at. And again, the rule is simple. Look at the one to its immediate right. If it's five or more, I round up, which means I add one to that spot, keeping everything in front exactly the same. But now at the whole number's places where I'm rounding, I must keep zeros in order to guarantee that I'm still talking about, in this case, thousands. And if I threw that away, I'm implying that I have 150 rather than 15,000. So we are required to keep placeholder zeros with whole numbers. So here again, find the nearest hundred. The one just before it is five or more, so I'm going to add one to the one before it while changing these to zeros in order to keep the magnitude. But now if I add 1 to this 9, it becomes a 0, which carries 1 to that 9, which becomes a 0, which carries 1 to this. But you see the rule hasn't changed. It's just that we got something perhaps a little bit unusual in the process but we're still finding the point of round off, looking at the digit just to its right. If it's five or more, we're adding one to the requested round off place, and whatever we get, we get. And we're keeping zeros below the round off point in order to keep the magnitude. Now down here, we find the nearest hundredth, Look to the immediate right. That's four or less, so I leave everything in front alone. But I must insert placeholder zeros, again, to keep the magnitude of the number in its proper range. Do you see this? This is very important, and there's a tendency for beginners to forget it. And always remember that, in fact, we are approximating the same number. And in some textbooks, you will see these double squiggle lines to mean approximately equal. Some will use an equal sign with a dot above it to mean approximately equal. Most will simply use an equal sign, assuming you know that it's rounded off from the context of the problem. I hope you find this a simple lesson, but please don't underestimate its importance. This is your host, Bob Fennell. We'll see you at the next lesson.